All right. So <laughs> I started this morning <clears throat> with a with fish story and the bear. Start the afternoon uh, with another one, uh, and it's it's quite recent. <clears throat> I was down in uh, Mexico uh, last week on a holiday with my family, and uh, how many people have been to Puerto Vallarta? Right? So there's a you know I was I was having lunch uh, in the marina uh, where all the boats are, and I saw this. I'm not making this up. Like this is it was so perfect. I saw about a 10 to 12 foot crocodile. Right, so you, you, you occasionally get crocodiles in the marina, um, but generally not that big. And so I'm, I'm about 15 feet away from this thing. It's down the rocks and it's just swimming. And, and it's heading towards a pelican. And the pelican's just sitting there in the water. And the crocodile's about probably 50 feet away. And, and I'm, I'm a guy. Like, I'm, I can hardly wait. <laughs> and I'm like, this is... This is National Geographic at its finest, right? But you know, there, but that's, then there's a logical part of my brain that says, yeah, it's going to be disappointing, though. The, the damn pelican's going to see that, that crocodile, uh, and uh, it's going to fly away, and I'm just going to be left here feeling empty. But anyway, so the crocodile, a couple people laugh. I'm just being honest. Right? So the crocodile, so anyway, the, the, this crocodile, it's huge, and there's about 10 other people that are beside me on the side of the marina watching this, average age of that community, about 86. So they're thinking different things than I am. Right? So anyway, this, this crocodile goes, and the crocodile actually bumps into the pelican. Like it bumps it with its nose. I can still see it. It's kind of like a uh, And then the pelican all of a sudden realizes, I think there's a crocodile there. And then the crocodile grabs it, rips its beak off, rolls a few times, and eats it. So now I'm thinking, that was fantastic. Right? Because I was so ready to be disappointed. And it actually was like watching wildlife and I, the old people, oh, this is bad, you know. So why do we tell that story? You don't want to be the pelican. I had no intention of telling this story. But I was having lunch with a colleague of mine, and I was sharing this story. And he goes, you might want to think about using that analogy. Because I do see this happening around the world in different markets. It is, we see this sea change happening. Right? You, know, you see it coming. Um, it even bumps India. Um, but sometimes you don't want to wait too long to make the adjustments. You don't want to be the pelican. Right? So what I want to do with the afternoon, <laughs> how's that for a grounding story, eh? Is uh, I want to start to get, no, not so good. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be the pelican. Yeah, the, it was disgusting, but entertaining. Anyway, and I lost my phone the day before in the ocean. I didn't even have evidence. Now, no compassion from this group. The Canadians, eh? Anyway, get bears in your yard. You'd be the same way. So um, I'm going to spend the afternoon hopefully sharing some things that you can do immediately. Like, I'm not a big, not about theory. Theory's interesting, right? Philosophy is interesting. But I want to leave you with some stuff that you can start to execute immediately that we've helped other partners do around the world. Uh, so you can go to their own websites. You can look at what they do. It's practical and pragmatic. That's going to be my commitment to you. Uh, but it's going to be all anchored in that psychology that we talked about. So when I was thinking about designing the day, um, you always kind of break what, what you do before lunch into a bucket and what you do after lunch into a bucket. The morning is about the why, generally. Uh, why is it important that we, we start to change? And what I hope landed is it's not change for Microsoft's sake. It's not change for your sake. It's changed because customers are changing. The demand is different. Right? They're looking for different solution sets. Right? It's not something that we can control. Right? So I kind of hope that landed. The fact that Microsoft is changing as well, and you're one of their valued partners, I think that's another motivating reason to start to consider different business models and different solutions. Right? And the second part of the morning was really around, OK, so if I want to move my business a little bit more towards focus, differentiation, unique solution sets, all that sort of thing, well, what does that look like? Right? So that's why we kind of walk through the IP staircase. It's not all about becoming an ISV. Different steps along the way. Right? There's different impacts to your economics around that. And then I wanted to share at a very high level a way of vetting your solution so you don't build something nobody buys. Right? So that was kind of the morning. It was all around why change and, and then what does a, a new solution offering your differentiation look like? The afternoon is about customer acquisition. So let's assume for the moment 
You've bought into the concept that you want to be different and bring something to the market that has a higher margin structure, and you've got an idea of what that might look like. This is going to be about, about how we bring that to market. Now, I believe, I'm going to start with marketing, I'm going to move to sales, and then I'm going to, then I'm going to end with the P&L. Right? <laughs> at the end of the day, <laughs> that's where the rubber hits the road. Um, uh, and, and so my, be my belief about marketing, from a psychology perspective, it is their responsibility to create bias. So who, who here in the room owns marketing? Yeah, who here is a marketing professional? That's your, that's your discipline. Few of those, fantastic. Right, so it's sales responsibility to create a strategic tipping point, a moment in the buying journey that convinces that prospect that your sales team is the right choice. I'm going to talk about that later. But it is marketing's responsibility to create a bias that your company is probably the right one to go with. Right? So you go back to that psychological buying motion. I pay attention at the beginning. I anchor on key information. I make a premature cognitive commitment. I go into confirmation bias. And then I move into consistency principle. Right? So what you'll see in there is that once a human being makes up their mind about something, it's very difficult to change. Not because they don't want to, but because they can't. Who's married? Yeah. Do I need to say anything else? <laughs> right? you, go back, you go back to that consistency principle. Hey, honey, you know, if you just looked at the situation through a, a rational lens, evaluated the new information, you might come to a new conclusion. Ha <laughs> ha! Try that one. <laughs> right? Wildly irrational. That's why I travel. So, uh, so marketing's responsibility is to create bias. It's uh, the sales team's responsibility to create a strategic tipping point. I'm going to get back to that later. Now, uh, when most partners do the, the assessment on uh, the marketing section, it looks a little bit like this. You know, how many marketing professionals do we have? Not very many, if any. Uh, how much do we spend on marketing? Generally not very much. Do, do we have a calendar, a nurture calendar, where we create content uh, in advance intentionally to, to stimulate activity? Uh, not a lot of activity there. Uh, do we use any kind of marketing automation tool? And do we have an upsell, cross-sell? Are there other metrics to measure? For sure. But I will tell you, these are the five most important. Right? But this is generally the starting point that I see. So if we go back to the changing buying behavior, marketing owns negative 15% all the way up to 65. And then they own from the close through to you know, the ongoing nurture, upsell, cross-sell. It's a marketing responsibility. It's hard, to, it's hard to do with no people and no money and no processes. Right? So I want to kind of share with you blah, blah, blah. Here's the four key things that I believe partner marketing organizations need to get good at. Right? And I'm going to walk through these four uh, in some detail. Uh, one, if you believe there's a higher probability that a prospect will find you before you find them, uh, then you need to get found. And I will tell you that you know, search engine optimization in search engine marketing uh, is a starting point. You, you have to do it. But the duration of time it takes for it to pay off is monumental, and it's a science. So if you have a good SEO uh, organization or, 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 or personality that you work with, treat them well, because that's hard stuff. But what will really draw people in is content. It's content. Right? So what people are looking for is information. They would rather research online. They would rather educate themselves before they disclose who they are to vendors. So if you don't have anything to teach them, they will find it somewhere else. Right? So, so when we think about getting found, right, it's about someone doing a search in language that is normal to them, and then finding a white paper, or a video, or a webcast, or an infographic, or a something right, that, that looks interesting. Like, that's how people find our company. They don't go looking for neural impact. They, they look for psychology, and sales engagement, and all kinds of other crazy things, and they find our content, or our videos. Right, so I'm going I'm to I'm show you some examples. The second thing, once you get found, is now you've got to convince this person to tell you who they are. So we go back to today's earlier discussion about the what, the how, and the why. 
My belief is a what person will change will tra will, will will exchange their name for something that's worth about five bucks. So you kind of think about you know the conversion tools that you would need. Right? They'll change they'll trade their name for a white paper. They'll trade their name for a video. They'll trade their name for a webinar. They'll trade their name for pretty much anything. But you move up into the how up the organizational food chain, they probably want something that's worth about 50 bucks. Now, it doesn't mean that they're going to pay for it, but think about the value that you need to deliver to, to get a manager in a, in a, in a mid-sized company to tell you who they are. And then the executives think about 100 bucks. So just a number, right? So what's going to get you to give up your name? So the conversion, you got to think about three different personas, and you got to think about, well, would I trade my contact information, my legitimate contact information for that. Right? So that's where a lot of partners fall down. When we do audit uh, on partner websites, really the only conversion tools we see nine times out of 10 is a contact us, which psychologically is an order. Contact us. I'd rather not. <laughs> Anyone be like, like to be told what to do? We'll go back to the marriage analogy. No, nobody likes to be told what to do. Right? So cont rather than you know, turning it into something that's more engaging, right? So, but if you don't have anything that you'll trade their name for, you'll never get the conversion. Right? They'll look at your website and it'll disengage. The third thing is triage, right? So battlefield term. I mentioned earlier that 85 to 90% of the leads that you get will be early stage engagement, right? The earlier they are in the buying journey, the easier it is to get their name because there's no threat that they're going to be inundated with sales professionals bothering them. It's true of the sales cycle too. Right? The closer you get to the end of a sales cycle, psychologically, the more the buyers withhold because they don't want to expose anything. Right? The fourth thing, so, so the reason that, that that triage is so important is you need to be able to determine relatively quickly, do I send this directly to a sales professional who engages deeply with the right amount of research to drive an intense conversation, or do I put it into long-term nurture? If you send them all to sales, your salespeople will be so busy trying to follow up on crap leads, they'll have no time to do research. You want to hear an interesting statistic? Oh. Who here chases big deals? Yeah, a couple of commas sometimes. Right? Expensive cost of sale. So when I'm whiteboarding a sales process with companies that pursue large opportunities, I will ask the question at the beginning. As a friendly Canadian, hey, lead comes in. What do you do first? We research. Fantastic. How much do you research? Right, now remember, salespeople are in the room, CEOs in the room, VP of sales or sales directors in the room. Well, you know what? I hear one of three answers. 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. <laughs> because the CEO is in the room, I already know it's a lie. If I'm lucky, they might do 10 minutes. You can't do anything in 10 minutes. You certainly can't do anything in, even in 20 minutes that your competitors can't do. So the next answer I get, well, I do 60 to 90 minutes worth of research. Right? Now, assume for the moment that this is a meaningful lead. You recognize the company, you know they're real. It's not just somebody with a Gmail account, right? This is a real company. And then the third answer, and then I'll ask them, OK, 60 to 90 minutes, interesting. What do you do? And they have answers, real answers. And then the third thing I'll hear as well, and again, these are larger transactions, I do two to four hours worth of research. Really? I've never done two to four hours of research in my life. I didn't believe them when I first, first started to hear this. And, but they would have a very, very specific answers about what they did. Now, the reason I share those three numbers, 15 to 20, 60 to 90, two plus they directly correlate to the win rate every time. Right? So the 20% win rate sales professionals typically do less than 30 minutes of research before they think about picking up the phone. And sometimes it's zero. The partners that drive the 50% win rates on average will do 60 to 90 minutes worth of research. And of course, the ones with the 80% win rates will do more than two hours. Why? Because they know where to go. They're maniacally focused on certain industry segments. And so they know the company. They know the business problems. They know what research reports to look at, who their competitors are. They just know more. Right? So there's, there's a huge correlation between amount of time invested in research 
and that first and the win rate. So why is that so important up here? Because if we're sending our salespeople everything under the sun, they have no time to do research. Right? We're, we're crippling them. Right? So that job is a marketing job. Most people will put that resource in the sales organization. Your job is to qualify. Anyone do that here? Sort of have a, a resource that's responsible for qualification? Um, think, if, for those of you that have your hands in the air, uh, think about the, the, the experience that that individual brings to the table. Who do you think most companies put in the triage role? The, the least expensive, least experienced, least knowledgeable individual they have in the company. And they ask pedestrian questions that, that just offend the buyer. Hey, do you have any money? <laughs> yeah, lots of it. Hey, are you the decision maker? Yeah. Uh, janitors make all the choices around here. Hey, what are your needs? Right, they might get something. Timing? Right, so when you ask the bad questions, rest assured you're getting three lies in response. Yeah, I'm going to tell you your budget. Yeah, I'm the decision maker. And yeah, we're going to decide soon. Like, I need you to give me some information. Right, so we still need to get that data, uh, but we just can't ask for it. So, so what I'm going to encourage you to think about for that role is move it to marketing. Now, there's got to be a sufficient volume of leads to keep that individual relatively busy, but hire uh, and, and, and pay more for that role than you would. So what I encourage partners to do is make the triage role a marketing role, and that individual has two responsibilities. One, to deal with the inflow of leads, ask the right questions, not to qualify them, but to determine whether they belong in an active sales cycle or long-term nurture. And when they're not doing that, they're actually developing marketing content. These are not salespeople. Their job is not to sell anything. You cannot qualify someone into a deal. I'm not that smart. But you can determine whether there's an active opportunity or not. So you actually reward them on sales accepted leads if you want to have any kind of variable compensation. Their job is to just get it right, not to generate a certain number of leads. I could talk all day long about that, but I'm going to stop right there because I'm getting all worked up. Right? But I can tell you, there are, there are so many partners, uh, and I learned this from partners. I didn't bring this to them. I learned this from successful partners, and then I, of course, took it on as my own and promoted it. Right? But, but the, the, some of the most successful partners uh, have uh, marketing do all of the qualification. And then the last part is, is the nurture. So if the majority of your, of your leads are not ready for an active buying cycle, because it's just people trading their names for something, well, what are you going to do to them on an ongoing basis to let them know you're alive. How many people here have unsubscribed to something in the last seven days? How many people unsubscribe to that thing after more than three or four months of subscribing to it? Right, so it's easy to subscribe. It's easier to unsubscribe. So we, we only send content that's going to be interesting to people because you can't get them back afterwards. Right? Now, there's two purposes to nurture. Right? <laughs> the first. Remind them of the fact that you're alive. The second one, remind them of their misery and suffering. <laughs> right? You've got to constantly peel off the Band-Aid in a respectful way and pour some salt in. Right? So develop some case studies and things like that and stories and that talk about business challenges that you solve. So anyway, I'm going to go into these four uh, and give you some examples. Now, I talked earlier about 151. Now, now, the reason that this is so important is because if you are accepted, if you are accepted as a member of your prospect's tribe, it's very hard to lose because you're safe. Right? So, so, so if you know that, I want to become a member of the tribe, I need to understand the vocabulary of the tribe. I need to understand the images of the tribe. I need to understand the problems of the tribe. Right? And, and anyone here ever had someone come and try to sell something to you? And you very quickly realize they actually don't know your business? Yeah. Picture Mark Stewart a long time ago selling ERP and not knowing the difference between discrete manufacturing and process. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I laugh today too. Not so funny in the moment. I was in this meeting and I, I don't know what I'm talking about really. And uh, they realized, I realized later after I'd been kicked out of the deal, 
that there's a difference between the two. And I'm speaking to them as if they were a process manufacturer. Right? So not a member of the tribe, high risk. If he doesn't know, the delivery team probably doesn't know, run for the hills. Right? So this thing, this 151 tribal, it is ingrained in your psyche. Funny story. Uh, anyone here Norwegian? Couple, good. just going to offend one or two. <laughs> right? So anyway, no, I'm not really going to offend the Norwegians. Um, I do a lot of work in Europe, and uh, I was invited to come in and do a, a two-day workshop with CEOs of partners in Norway. And about halfway through day one, I go up to my sponsor, uh, Jürgen, and I said, hey, Jürgen, okay, I, I, I owe you an apology. Like, I don't know why, but this, this is not landing here. Like, I need some guidance. Oh, Mark, they love it. No, they don't. I know a thing or two about engagement, right? And so this grumpy looking thing, that is not, oh, I love this guy. No, 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 Mark, they, they're sending me texts. They think this is great stuff. They hate each other. <laughs> what? Yeah, they hate each other. Like if there's two partners walking down the street, it's a small little town, Oslo, and there's a lot of partners, and they hate each other. They're stealing from each other. They're putting in stink bids so that if they're going to lose a deal. No one's going to make any money. They're litigating. Oh, so they hate each other, but they love you. Keep going. OK. Anyway, danger pay every time I go back there. But, but a year later, I'm at WPC in Washington, DC. And I walk into the lunchroom. And who do I see in the corner? About 100 Norwegians. Only the Norwegians would give their teams a fleece vest for Washington, DC in the summer. <laughs> and only a Norwegian would wear it. So they're sitting there. Right? The further you are from home, the more important your tribe becomes. You will gravitate towards your tribe the farther you are from home. It is unconscious. Right? So anyway, they're all hanging together, loving each other. I can guarantee as soon as they got on the plane, they went back to hating each other again. Right? This happened to me shortly after that. I'm in uh, Munich. I'm, I fly in early because uh, it's a long jet laggy thing. And I'm there on the weekend. It's Sunday. I'm in this main square. It's a beautiful day. And I see on the other side of the square a Canadian. You know, flag on the backpack or something. I'm like, oh, ha, Canadian. Right there I am walking across the square. And, and I'm halfway to them. And I, I'm thinking to myself, what the hell is going on? Right? I was in Vancouver two days ago, surrounded by thousands of Canadians. I'm not going up into them in the street. Hey, are you a Canadian? Let's, let's have a coffee. The further you are from home, the more important tribal is to you. Right? I, anytime I tell a story, I'll tell you why I'm doing it. Different part of your brain is listening to the story. I can tell you tribal is important, and you may agree cognitively. Right? But when we shift into storytelling, what happens is the, the 9 million instructions per second uh, kicks in. And um, with few exceptions, m most people have an empathy gland. They're called mirror neurons. Inside your head is a cluster of neurons uh, that are designed to feel other people's feelings, but also to be able to watch what somebody else is doing and actually know how to do it. The human beings are the only uh, species on the planet uh, that have these, these mirror neurons. Right? So when I'm telling the story, whether you know it or not, you're actually living it. Because I want to land this. So whenever there's a story, know I'm trying to land this point because it's more important than others. Right? The Norwegians don't like the story. That's why I had to go to the next one in Munich. I didn't ask about the Germans. Right? 151. Yes? Do the Norwegians offend? Like a party in Washington was possible. <laughs> yeah, I'll repeat that. That's not worth the microphone. <laughs> yeah, to his <laughs> yeah, to defense, the Norwegians, yeah, your liver is going to hurt after those people come to town. Yeah. Or they drink to put up with each other, one of the two. So here's the psychology behind this, right? Tribal, which is industry or workload or persona knowledge, equals safety. Safety is three times more powerful than greed as a motivator of human behavior, study after study. So I want to show you some examples of partners uh, that uh, do a really good job of tribal engagement, right? Things that you can emulate. Uh, uh, PTG, uh, obviously, uh, they focus on dentists, yeah, right? A IT support for dental offices. HIPAA compliance and Office 365 for dental offices. 
Right? So now there's a bunch of text. There's some other bad stuff that's in there. But I'm telling you, if you're a dentist and you're looking for Office 365, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Question over here. OK. Um, I agree with uh, everything you're saying about the, the nurturing process and, and getting found. And we've been doing tons of that. My question is, um, is marketing automation software or a marketing automation platform pretty much mandatory at this point in the cycle? Mandatory. Impossible to do effective nurture manually. Impossible. Now the good news is what I used to sell years ago for 5,000 bucks a seat in CRM, we now can basically subscribe to for a few dollars a month. Right? But I would say it's, why it's one of the five questions that we have in the marketing section in the profile assessment is do you have a marketing automation system? Absolutely critical. Great question. Yeah. Yeah. Because the intention is to drive a tremendous amount of interest, you can't nurture them with people in a cost-effective way. Yeah. So tribal engagement is another example. Uh, lawware. Right? So here, there's a little bit more of a technology spin. Uh, these folks, it's a UK partner, uh, practice management software for law firms, right? helping you get the most out of your legal business. Nothing in here about Office 365, but the majority of their solution set is anchored in it. So if you're, now, and you've got to look at the pictures. Does the person on the left here sort of look like a dentist? No. I don't know. It's a terrible image. What about the lawyer on the right? Does that look like a lawyer? A little bit more like a lawyer, right? So, so the, whether these people have consciously gone out and picked images that, that are going to resonate at a tribal level. And they speak the, the legal language. Here's our friends from SureWeb, right? On the ERP side of the house, uh, organization we work with, uh, in Toronto, uh, industry built, right? Do food better, food ops, food safety, food business, got nothing to do with ERP. Does the image look like something you might see in a food manufacturing segment? For sure, right? LS Retail, another client of ours. And we started working with these folks, uh, they're the ISV of the year, I think last year. You know, they had a typical Microsoft partner website, ERP, NAV, POS, I mean, it was all in there. Right? Now, what we realized is they had segments that they were super strong in. One was grocery. Now, what do you think is the most highly, the, the, the highest margin product in a grocery store that spoils the quickest? Raspberries. So it's no accident. Right? It was, okay, so if I'm running a grocery store, that represents to me utopia. Right? Fresh stock, growing margins, speedy checkouts. Yes, question down here. <laughs> I'm going to ask her. Yeah, no, we're good. It was just a negative comment. <laughs> but I'm going to remind her of that. Hey, look, honey, I think you did this one. Yeah. But so the, the, the purpose of, of showing you some of these websites is, is if you're a grocer, this is going to resonate with you as well. So just some examples. Of, they use the right language. They use the right pictures. And then they focus on, on the right topics. Right? And we showed you this one a little bit earlier. Right? Uh, but it goes a bit deeper. Right? So now you've got companies like CDW <coughs> out there who historically, a bit of a horizontal play, they have some of the best tribal content I've found in terms of this community. Right? So they've got nonprofit IT technology. There's like six layers that you can go into when you click through this stuff. If you're a not-for-profit looking for some technology support, there's nobody on the planet that I've found that would even come close to creating the comfort and safety that you would get from CDW. Right? So just some great examples of places to go. This is the content that they produced underneath it. So they've got white papers, and then they've got downloads, and they've got videos. Right? And very little of it has anything to do with technology. Right? So just some really good examples of organizations that you know uh, that are very good at tribal. Right? And then there's persona. You know, so if you're focused on an industry or vertical, right, it's going to be groceries and dentists and doctors and fitness memberships and those sorts of things. But, but if you don't want to go that deep into a focus, you're kind of left with a workload. Right? Something that spans multiple industries. 
And when you're selling into or marketing into something that spans multiple industries, you're actually selling to an individual persona. So if it's call center, it'll be like a call center manager. Right? So here, they, this organization has done a tremendous job of trying to figure out when someone goes to their website, who are you? Right? IT is my day job. Aha, going to give a certain sort of look and feel and content to these people because they speak our language. Or this is not my day job. I'm going to, this is probably a how or a why person. Right? So just a really good example of an organization right, that defines the persona early on and then creates two different content streams for it. Right? Now, I want you to take a look at these words. <clears throat> and you got to ask yourself in your heart of hearts, how many of these would I find in your marketing material? <laughs> right? There's an exercise I actually do uh, when I'm working with individual companies. And the challenge will be, look, you've got 10 minutes. Who can come up with a sentence that actually consumes as many of these as is pot and, and is still a legitimate sentence? Ah, oh, we make, you know what? Uh, scale, we deliver scalable, manageable, reliable, powerful, easy to use business software. Best in class, best of read, end to end solutions that increase revenues and reduce your costs. Anyone have something like that on your website? Yeah, the laughter of recognition. Yeah. So here's a funny thing. Not really. <laughs> funny to me. Uh, there was a, a global marketing agency right, that took these words and hundreds of others. And they went to multiple countries and multiple languages. And they hooked people up to EEGs. Now EEG is that sort of that skull cap with a bunch of wires. And what it can do is it measures electrical charges. Sort of at a very rudimentary level, is it a positive charge or a negative charge or a neutral? Like there is no charge. And there's a bunch of other stuff it does. But what they wanted to do with this study is determine, does this trigger good, bad, or, or nothing? So all of these words here, so give me an example. Let's say I said the word mother-in-law. What kind of charge is that going to drive? A oh, positive charge, of course. <laughs> what are you people? Or you could say, hey, beer. Ah, that might be a positive charge. Vacations, right? So there's a positive and negative. Every single one of these words is dead, meaning that they're so overused by so many industries to describe so many things that the human brain does not know what they mean. There's no anchor. There's no reference point. Your brain does not know what these means. So here's the test right? For, for using language in marketing materials, true of sales materials. And just for clarity, I think marketing is, should be responsible for creating every single sales asset. Let's put that on the table. We can come back to it later. Right? But the test is, because 70% of the population is, is primarily visual, another 20% are almost visual, like 90% of the world thinks in pictures, is you just close your eyes just for a minute. And then someone says something like, productivity improvement. Hmm. You get anything good? OK, we'll try it again, right? Scalability. Hmm, not much. Hmm. Optimization. Hmm, bit blank. Digital transformation. <laughs> right? like there's no, if there's no picture, when someone reads that stuff, uh, there's no image, no image, no emotion. So that's the test of marketing, especially when you've got headlines and really key pieces that you want to call out, is just get your people in the office together and say, hey, close your eyes. I'm going to read this to you. What does this word mean to you? You get some strange responses. Right? That's the test. If you can't produce a picture, it's a dead word. Right? Or you're creating a website for the 10% of the population that's auditory. <laughs> and they don't go on online. <laughs> no one likes my joke. I'm moving on. Right? <laughs> I'm auditory. I can't see anything. Nothing at all. Can I ask a question on that? Yes. How do you uh, balance that with SEO terms, though, and that's what people are typing in? Yeah, it's a great question. Right? How do we balance out what's going to drive an emotional response, uh, therefore a trigger, and the SEO? Right? So my, my crafty way is bury the SEO stuff in places that are not critical for viewing. 
right? So there's some art to how do you put that stuff in so it gets pulled out in the right place. Uh, but if I had to make a choice between getting found for some acronym and using a word that's going to draw an image or an emotion, I'm going to pick the second every time. My guidance. And following up on that question, yeah. um, when I look at your website, yeah. you have a compelling animated you know, infographic yeah. that, that makes me stick around longer rather than read a bunch of words. Mm -hmm. And then you take me to the words. So mm -hmm. like the previous question, I feel like we need to ideal marketing these days would be some kind of visual, attractive magnet kind of thing that gets them to stick around 10 seconds, but then still has all the words that the SEO is looking for, whether it's, you know, managed service provider San Francisco or Microsoft, Gold Partner, Minneapolis, or whatever it is they're looking for. Is yeah. that an accurate way of thinking about it? That is accurate. Yeah, so we, uh, you'll see our website change a lot as we experiment with new stuff. I will tell you this, there's not a lot of science out there around how to do this right. There's a lot of experimentation. But our belief in what we see works, start with why, move to how, go to what. Because a why person is not going to go looking on your website for stuff. So you need to have something on the, on the landing page above the fold that's going to be visually and emotionally engaging to a why person. Now a how person, right, they're looking for specific business process improvements generally. You know, they, they can be, go below the fold, but they're generally going to resonate with the why as well. The what stuff, you can put wherever you want. Because a what person will scurry around like a squirrel looking for stuff in the far deep recesses of your website. Too much of the what content is on the landing page. The one partner we work with in Switzerland um, had some of the biggest outdoor apparel brands on the planet as customers. I had to click six times on their website to find it. Right? So, so that's tribal. If I'm an apparel company, especially an outdoor apparel company, and I see North Face and Mammoth and all these other ones, oh, member of the tribe, trustworthy. I'm going to go in. There's something for me here. So just by moving their, their social proof, is what it's called, right, up to above the fold, uh, their lead generation went through the roof. Right? So simple things like that. But think about why, how, and what in, in that order. And I'm going to get into, in a few minutes, some really good examples of how to do that. Other questions? Great questions. OK, fantastic. So psychological reactants, that's what we're looking for here. Now, psychological reactant is something that stimulates an emotion that puts people into action. Right? So emotion, the Latin behind that, is something that moves me, makes me, makes me go into motion. Now, the human being that we all are, we, we have a wide range of emotions that we experience. But there are only six that are tied to your survival. These six here. So when you have an experience that triggers fear, when you have an experience that triggers anger, surprise, joy, that memory is actually stored physically in a different part of your limbic system called your amygdala. Now, the rest of your experiences are stored in other places that are kind of hard to find. Right? So if you're experiencing one of these, it means it, this is important to my survival. I need to be able to retrieve it quickly. I'll give you an example of how that works. Right? So let's say it's a couple thousand years ago, and uh, I'm out on a hunting party with my, my best hunting partner right here. And we're, we're in some remote part of the forest, and out from behind a large tree, jumps a wild animal and unfortunately chews you to pieces. I mean, there's marrow and blood and gut stuff flying all over the place. Now, in that moment, do you think I might experience some fear? This is the interactive part of the day. OK, good. Woo! Still with me. Good. Yeah. So do you think I might experience some joy? Yeah, it depends. Yeah. Your pretty good wife back at the cave. Single now. How about anger? Canadian humor. Yeah, probably anger. He's my best friend. At least he was. I'd be angry. Sadness, lost a good friend. Disgust? Eh, depends if you watch. How about some surprise? Yeah, right? So in that moment, that experience, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel four of the six most powerful emotions. Now, 
let's assume it's a couple months later, new hunting partner. We're in the same part of the forest. Something moves in the bushes. What do you think the brain's going to do? Oh, having a deja vu moment. There's something familiar about this. I wonder what it was. Oh, but by then you're dead. Right? So the reason that your brain stores memories tied to these emotions in a different place is so it can retrieve them quickly. Because I'll tell you, as soon as the bushes move, I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to yell, run, or I'm going to trip them. Europeans like that. <laughs> North Americans, not so much. But anyway, it's cultural. Right? So, so the reason I share this is because if you want to tap into both from a marketing and a sales perspective, if you want to tap into your prospect's emotions, you got to know which ones you're targeting. Now, if you can create a marketing campaign around anger, disgust, or sadness, please send it to me. <laughs> I want to see it. I desperately do. But I would argue that you might want to avoid those. That's why they're red. Right? But when you're creating marketing content, assets, messaging, value propositions, uh, sales collateral, all that stuff, you want to really think about risk. Right? It's the backside of fear. Right? Desire or growth or greed, right? which is uh, our business language uh, for joy. And the most powerful of them all is curiosity. So surprise is actually the backside of curiosity. When something surprises someone, it means that they didn't expect it. And what you drive is the Scooby-Doo moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a key part of the sales cycle. And I want to drive the Scooby-Doo moment. Mm -hmm. Tell me more. Right? So if those are the emotions, I want to give you some examples of some partners that have used them really well. Right? So uh, this, is, uh, this is Crayon, a big partner in Europe, GDPR. Kind of a big deal over there, right? If, you, if you're not uh, compliant, uh, you could face up to a 20 million euro fine. And what I love about what they've done is, is, the, is the countdown. That's what I'm calling out here. Because I went to this website, and it's counting down by the minute how much time you have left before you are non-compliant and eligible for a fine. Oh, you know it. Yeah, look at this thing. How would your enterprise manage a $20 million fine? So what did you eat for breakfast today? Here's the interesting thing about the brain. <laughs> there's always one that didn't eat. It's, it's a stupid question. And there's, there's no reason for me to ask it. But before you can think, well, that's a stupid question. Why is he asking that? You've already got your answer. Your brain will always respond to a question, and it will find an answer. So when you write, hey, how would your enterprise manage a 20 million euro fine? Hmm, not sure we could. It's brilliant. I don't know if they know what they're doing or not, but that's a powerful, powerful website. Right? Really good example of leveraging, uh, we'll call it the fear, in a respectful way. I don't believe in fear mongering. It doesn't work. It's, it's not about that at all. It's about recognizing where does the risk sit in a business and, and phrasing and, and managing your content in a way that resonates with people. Right? Uh, this is a, an asset I wrote for BDO. It's their single biggest lead conversion tool on their website. Right? Seven software selection mistakes that spell failure. And they're all real. Right? Generates tons of leads for them. What emotion am I going after? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pick the wrong thing. It's got nothing to do with any technology whatsoever, and it can be applied to any technology project. What are the big seven mistakes? Never use 10. Sounds too crafty. Now, this thing is a bit of brilliance. SAP. <laughs> I work there. I can do it. So I'm walking through an airport in Hong Kong. I stopped. I turned around, and I, and I took a picture of this. Now, that's obviously not the picture, because I would have had to use my wife's camera. Right? I downloaded the real one. Um, but remember those mirror neurons? Right? So if you were just to pick an emotion that that woman is experiencing, what would it be? Joy. My first thought was actually relief. Anyone here not touched by cancer in some way, shape, or form? Everyone has, right? So, so this, is, this, is, this is a brilliant piece of marketing where they associate SAP with relief. <laughs> oh, let me tell you. 
There is no release when you're putting in SAP. It's like open heart surgery and a colonostomy with no anesthetic. If you're lucky, right? But hey, a new prescription for cancer care. See how the American Society of on Clinical Oncology is harnessing big data for unprecedented medical insights. It's a brilliant piece of marketing. Right? So that's their new theme. You'll see it all over the world. This is my favorite. You can see it's all wrinkly. I stole this. I liberated it from a magazine. Right? Because I want to pivot now into visual engagement, away from emotions. Right? So uh, what we know about vision is that um, the majority of your brain's activity is focused on processing what we see. The part of your brain that processes images is connected to the part of your brain that manages emotions. Right? The, this is the single easiest way to tap into people's feelings. Now, you can have a long conversation with your prospects about public versus private cloud. You could, or you could do this. Right? So you want to go on vacation. Do you want the private cloud experience? Or the Fort Lauderdale, no disrespect to anybody from Florida, spring break pool filled with college kids that drink 19 beers and never get out to pee. Right? That's one eighth urine. You know it. Yeah, the statistics are not good. There's like 22 gallons of urine in most public pools. That's a real number. Yeah, what emotion am I triggering? Disgust. You'll remember this, I promise. Right? But so, so which one do you want? Oh, I want the one on the bottom. Fantastic use of visuals. I get a lot of pictures from airports. I'm walking through the Charles de Gaulle airport in Paris. I see this thing, I turn around. I take a picture. Now, what emotion does this trigger? It's disgust. I love it. Now, what you don't know about this, because they did a crappy job in the layout of the design, is that there's a picture of a refrigerator on the bottom right-hand side. This is an IoT ad. This is about IoT. They, they develop refrigerators and kitchen appliances that are smart, that think for themselves. It's an IoT ad. Guess what? There's a series of them. As you go through the airport, there's just half fresh something, half nasty, rotten stuff. And you can't help yourself but look. So to your point earlier, you, you got to hook them and then give them the content. So they happen to focus on disgust. I think it's brilliant. Which one do you want? I don't want to eat the one on the left. That's nasty. Oh. Now, more stuff about visual engagement. You're on a website. You're somewhat interested in learning more about this company. So you have the contact Jason telephone button or the contact creepy Jason who you do not want to date your daughter. <laughs> I, got a, I have a daughter. If creepy Jason comes to my door, oh, it's a bad day. He's gonna, you know what I have hanging in my house? I'm not making this up. <laughs> Canadians, we don't have guns. Like if I got mad enough to shoot my wife, it would take a while, about six months. Take the test, pass it all, buy the gun, blah, blah, blah. I'm probably not mad anymore. But anyway, so anyway, I'm down in Arizona, and you guys have guns. And so I took my, my daughter and my son to a gun range to shoot stuff. And we came in, and we, were, we said, hey, we're Canadians. And we don't know how to shoot a gun. Help us. So my daughter got the princess package, and I got the uh, zombie apocalypse. There's a reason for this story, I promise. So anyway, my son, who is 14, and I, we get the zombie apocalypse. And, and there's one, we picked this image that looked like a young teenage boy, and we used the shotgun on him. And my son's job was to shoot him in the neck, and my job was to shoot him in the groin. And so we've got this image of a teenage boy peppered with about 4,000 shotgun holes, and we now have it hanging in a frame at home for the boyfriend that comes first. <laughs> no, I have this, and I'm going to point it out to him. That could be you, son. Um, Creepy Jason. It's Creepy Jason. Twice the conversion with Creepy Jason. Why? Because the human brain is drawn to human faces. So there's no emotional connection to an icon. Just put pictures of real people, ideally your own people. You have to move them after you fire them. But, but anyway, put your own people up there, and you will be shocked. I'm not joking. Right? And if you work for the company and your picture comes down, you know it's coming, right? <laughs> but anyway, 
So that's about using real faces. Uh, we experimented uh, with Power Objects, a uh, big CRM partner uh, in the US. And we created this all video website. And, and what we know is that your eyes follow where other people look. So uh, we had a conversion button. And then we had a picture of a person that looked like the target SMB buyer looking at the button. So your brain just naturally goes, oh, button, click. Huh. It's like clubbing seals. <laughs> Canadian sport. <laughs> No, we've got, we got nine months of hockey and three months of clubbing seals. Anyway, back up to this. So visual engagement. We got get started now. It's free, no trials, no fees, or get started now. Which one would you pick? You pick the red one, right? So for all the obvious reasons, we associate red with danger. Our brain goes towards it, click right through. And if you put a button on the right, it will be clicked 87% more than the one on the left. So you, you put a red button on the right, high probability someone's going to click it. Right? So your brain is designed to follow motion. Right? Things that moved in the past, you could chase down, kill, and eat. Or things that moved could chase you, kill you, and eat you. Right? So, so the easiest and the most effective way of tapping in to people's emotions is with video. How many people here proactively develop video today for your websites? Yeah, so please, if you take nothing else away from the two days that you are here, go back and build a studio. They're cheap. You can film on an iPad Air. You don't need a camera. You need a white backdrop, you need 500 bucks worth of lights, and you need a camera. And you need real people talking about authentic stuff. You can make it nicer, you can animate it, you can do all kinds of other stuff, but get yourself in the habit of using video. It will take a while before you figure it out. Start now. Because it is the laziest way for people to consume content. Now here's the other good news about video. Of all the material that has ever been produced on YouTube, all of it, only 5% has been watched for more than 45 seconds. Think about that. Right? So that, that statistic shows that you've got 45 seconds to capture someone's attention. Right? Watch yourself when you're watching videos. Now, if it's the crocodile that's coming towards the pelican, ah, I got a minute and a half for that. No one likes that, Canadians. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to leave that one alone. Right? So, so a couple important uh, uh, time frames. One is 45 seconds. Uh, if you get past 45 seconds, you have a maximum of two minutes. But know that when you've gone past 45 seconds, you're now moving into education. Right? And once you go past two minutes, you're into training. You know? so, so video is about short, high impact components that very quickly communicate your value prop. You can write a value prop, or you can have the CEO of the company explain why they started the business. None of you got into the business that you're in today accidentally. Right? There's some, always a story behind it. And it's that authenticity that people resonate with. So start to experiment with video. Because the brain can't stop watching it. Some great examples, uh, Canadian companies. Uh, uh, it's a telco uh, that have built a bunch of solutions around IoT. Right? Brilliant stuff from you know, managing the soil temperature at a farm all the way through to a factory, managing the temperature of the fruit or the jam that's being produced. Right? These things are fascinating examples. I would suggest you go and look at them. You look at the duration. A minute five, 59 seconds. Nice, short, crisp examples. High production. You don't need to do this. But it's a great example of technology. Now, we'll move on to simplicity. I talked earlier about how the brain punishes complexity. Punishes it. Right? So you're a consumer. How many of you are going to read what's on the left? Because <laughs> right? Microsoft produced both assets. Right? No, you did. You guys at the back, it's good stuff, I'm sure. I've never really read it. Right? No, because right, so, so the problem with, with text is that you don't know where the good stuff is. So you've got to go sort of top to bottom, left to right, to kind of tease out, well, where's the good stuff in here? And you know you've got to read it all. To, or you can build an infographic. I've read the entire infographic. I could probably recite it. 
Right? So both say the same thing. One will be ignored. One will draw people in. Now again, let's assume for the moment that you are interested in the cloud. And you had an option of trading your name for this or trading your name for this. It's a no-brainer. Right? This is simple. I can go anywhere I want in here. Right? I can tease out the piece that I want. Uh, Microsoft came to me uh, when they launched uh, AX7, right? so Dynamics 365 Operations. And they wanted uh, some help optimizing uh, the sales team that was going to deal with the leads that come in around the product launch. And their call to action tool uh, was a 35 page white paper. Possibly the best content I have ever read about the future of manufacturing. Now they created these white papers for a number of different industries. So I looked at this thing, read it cover to cover, and I'm like, okay, uh, you got the best content in the world no one's ever going to read. Because it was why content. It was about industry trends and drivers and metrics and changes and strategy. It was 35 pages of, of text. So I said, I could take this, I could turn this into 20 assets that are short that an executive would consume. Right? So if you think about creating content and assets around simplicity, how long do you think a what person would spend consuming an asset? Could be a webcast, reading an ebook, watching a webinar. How, much, how long do you think a, the attention span of a what person is? It's about 60 minutes. If you have a 60 minute webinar or a 60 minute webcast, you're going to get a lot of what people. And they're going to stick it right through to the end, might even pay attention. How much time do you think a how person has to consume? 15 minutes. Now if it's rich stuff, you can drag them through to 30 minutes for sure. But when you're thinking about designing an asset, think about what can be consumed in 15 minutes. How much time do you think you have with a why person? Two. Right, so the only real assets that appeal to senior executives are infographics, <coughs> videos, they will consume an analyst report because it's unbiased, third party, good stuff. You probably want to put it out there in a PowerPoint format first. It doesn't mean that they can't read the 35 page document, but that's the next step. So think about configuring your assets and your content in terms of those three different personas and, and then you just apply the right asset to the right attention span. But at the end of the day, simplicity is everything. Now, Social engagement is the last piece. These are examples of content that LS Retail put out. Uh, I use them, I've had for years, I love them. They put them out on YouTube. Uh, they obviously focus on retail. Uh, they're an ISV that, that builds on top of Dynamics 365. But you don't know any of that by looking at their assets. Right? Are you getting the most out of your loyalty program? You know, four retailer fails at social media. It's like watching a train wreck. I love that stuff. Right? Uh, open a successful pop-up store right? in five easy steps. So this is industry content. It's got nothing to do with technology. People are curious about that. They go in and then they, oh, hey, who is this Ellis Retail Company? I better talk to them. Right? So when you think about putting stuff out there in that sort of social ecosystem, really think long and hard about what can you teach? What's going to trigger curiosity? The reason I show them here is because these are all things people are curious about. That's the emotion they're tapping into. All of the, uh, the videos in here are very short. Right? It's the teaser that gets them into the longer, the longer conversation. So the best way to convert someone is a two-step process. You've got to give to get. It's anchored in reciprocity. Right? Reciprocal societies survive. Reciprocal societies survive. Right? So people that take from the tribe and don't give back generally get killed and eaten. So wired into your DNA, into your psyche, is a need to give back when you get something of value. You can't control it. It's impossible. That's why a friend of yours can ask you to help them move, but all they own can fit into the back of a Volkswagen, and they pay you in beer and pizza. But 30 years later, you can go to them and say, hey, I need uh, some help moving. Now you've got a six bedroom house. Right? And you're not going to pay them, right? So there's an unconscious obligation we all carry if someone delivers something of value. That's what this is all about. So nurture is a two-step process. You want to drive a conversion. Something short and sweet and powerful and emotional 
They'll consume it, and at the end you say, hey, if you found this interesting, tell us who you are and we'll give you the rest of it. But you gotta give them enough meat up here to earn the right to the, tech, the second step. Most partners, they're not even partners, most marketing professionals try to convert on the first asset. You gotta give to get. When you force someone to tell you their name in return for something, it's reverse reciprocity. It's an ultimatum. It makes them mad at an unconscious level. Makes them mad. Yes? What about having, like we have like a chat program on the website. Yeah, so the, the, so the statement was you got a chat, uh, 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 a chat engine on your website. I think the question is what do you think about those things? Everybody needs chat. Everybody needs chat. Right? And, and it's a business process you got to think through. I've worked with Microsoft's own internal call centers developing chat strings. Why don't you have that uh, Candidly, we have more demand than supply. We can't take any more work. We don't have a lot of our conversion tools up. We got more work than we can deliver. If you can do neuroscience with Microsoft Dynamics, we're in business, brother. Yeah, but that's why we don't have a lot of this. So, but I'll tell you, the top performing partners in terms of lead generation have a chat engine. And guess, who, guess who's behind them? Marketing. So the same people that are doing the triage and developing marketing assets are the same ones that are doing the chat. They're not trying to convert a lead, they're trying to add value. Right? And so what we do is we structure those chat strings so that we always end a chat statement or phrase with another question to drive the dialogue. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a process behind everything. So but anyway, I can, I'm going down the rat hole on chat. It's a good thing. Because people don't feel guilty when they exit from a chat window. Have you? Yeah, you're two or three sentences into a chat conversation. You're not getting any more value. Click. Ha, I don't even feel bad. But if you're on a telephone call with a you know, vendor, they're trying to, it's kind of, you don't just hang up on them. Well, some people do. A buddy of mine does. He's a CFO. <laughs> he says, it's a true story. Guy runs a software company. Well, he's a CFO. Big one. ISV. And he says, hey, I'm not getting any value out of this conversation to salespeople. I'm hanging up now. Click. That's Blair. But aside from Blair, most people feel a bit guilty. Question over here. Question on um, gated versus ungated content. Yeah. Um, one of the authors of several marketing books that, that I've followed and, and someone that I've learned a lot from uh, in the inbound marketing world has said that on various occasions that you probably get s somewhere upwards of 30% more conversions from ungated content um, as you would with gated content. So I just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Is it a mixture? Do you believe in only gated content in terms of reciprocity, et cetera? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. So, we gotta, so the way I would answer that is, what's my end goal? My end goal is disclosure. I need to know who on my way is on my website and I need some way to contact them after the fact. Right, so the gating, the way that I believe the gating is a secondary piece is you gotta give to get. Because if I get a great video or a great white paper or a great infographic and I want more, well then I feel comfortable telling you who I am. But if we just wait for them to, to, to fill in the contact us button, there's no value for them to do that. So, so my, my, my belief is, I'm not sure what the data says behind that, is give away your best stuff for free first and then put a gate behind the deeper level. Give away the why, gate the how. That would be my guidance. Right. Yeah. But the beautiful thing about a marketing automation system is you can do A-B testing. You can, you can gate some stuff and not gate other stuff and see what your own results are. Right? But I'm looking at it purely from an emotional perspective. Yeah. All right, so here's a fun exercise. Like what I want you to do is I want you to go to the website of your most hated competitor. Yeah, whoever you just wake up not liking every day. Because if I get you to do it on your own website, well then you're all sad and angry at yourself because your websites suck. So it's a lot more fun 
if you're looking at your competitor's website. I like well, just pick the one that you like the least. Right? And what I want you to do is I just want you to spend five minutes on their website looking for examples of these six things. Now, part of why I want to do this is I want to break up the two hours. I, got, I want you, I'm just telling you what I'm doing to you. Sometimes I just do this because I put it in, oh, I might want to go to the bathroom in the middle. Better put an exercise in because it's hard to escape this place, but I'm not really doing that. Right? So I want you to, to think about the stuff that we talked about in terms of your competitor uh, and one that you lose to periodically. Hopefully not more than you win. Right? But do they have tribal engagement? Do they have proper engagement language? Do they have visuals that would resonate with your target customer? Right? Do they trigger the emotions in any way? Right? And, and do their, their, their call to actions, the gives to gets, do they give you something that's meaningful that you would want if you were a prospect? And I'm just going to give you five minutes to do it, and then I'm going to get a couple of examples from you, and then we're going to move on to sales. Uh, who, who found some stuff uh, that, was, that was actually quite good at one of their competitor sites? <laughs> Nothing there. Yeah. So do we have a couple of runners with mics? All right, so I just want to bring a mic down here. If you don't mind sharing, don't share who the partner is, but just uh, you know what you found compelling about it from an emotional perspective. Yeah, I mean, certainly th they had a lot of the, the people aspects of it, and certainly from a persona engagement, it was very clear that they were, if I am this type of role within my company, here is where I was driven to and provided that information very succinctly. Okay, fantastic. So sounds like a really good job of that persona identification and persona language. Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. Other examples of what you found on your competitive site that was good? Got it, one in the middle, right over here. Yeah? Or was that just like an auction? No. All right. All right, so I'm just going to hand you a mic. I just want to hear kind of what you felt was compelling or, or emotionally engaging. They had good tribal engagement on there. That was one of the things yep. that I noticed. Not so much persona um, and the language was, yeah, but definitely tribal. Tribal. So typically tribal will show up in, in pictures. It'll show up in industry language, right? Those sorts of things. Uh, identification of business challenges. Who found some nasty stuff? Yeah, there's lots of that out there. So who felt their competitor might have a more compelling website than, than, than you do? Just based on what you saw. Yeah, so there's going to be some of that too, right? So here's the good news. Um, not trying to sell you something. We do emotional website audits for really large partners in advance of significant website projects. Generally, those audits leave most marketing professionals apologizing for their websites. No, it's kind of an internal joke. Most of these, these, these calls sort of start with I, 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 an apology for how bad the website is. That is not the purpose of the audits. Right? So everyone's been trained to build websites around certain design principles. And, and what we're learning from a neuroscience perspective is the brain engages online in a radically different way. Right? So there's not a lot of guidance out there around how to build an emotionally engaging website. So it's not about being critical of whoever it is that you hired to build this in the past or, or if you built it yourself. We don't build websites. Right? So it's about looking at it through a completely different filter. So what we've done for Microsoft is we've actually created a mini website audit for you to do yourself for free. And, and it will give you six months worth of interesting work to do on your own website. Right, so again, we're not selling you anything. There's not an upsell, cross-sell. No one's going to phone you. Right, but just go to the URL, neuralimpact.ca mini audit. Not today, because I want to keep you engaged for the rest of the afternoon. And what we do is we look at the nine core elements of emotional engagement. And there are many of the things that I talked about today. Social proof, value exchange, tribal engagement, language engagement, visual engagement. Like This is science. These are the nine elements of emotional engagement. And then what I would encourage you to do is, is to bring a couple of your folks together in a room. It takes about an hour. And just go through these nine elements. We describe what they are. You capture your comments. Give yourself a rating of one, two, or three in terms of how strong you think you are at that. And then when you hit submit, we're going to send you a PDF with 
a whole pile of recommendations. And that's all you need to stay busy for a long period of time. Can we now, it? What's that? Can we resell that as a service? Talk to me later. Okay. <laughs> Not the first time we've had the question. Right, so again, I'm a big, big believer. You give away your best stuff for free. This is one of the best ideas we have come up with. It took months to get it right. Right, so when we do proper website audits, it, it's a big project, takes a bunch of time, but most of what you need is right in here. Right, so, so, so take some time, spend an hour, go through the audit, uh, it'll give you a bunch of recommendations and you can start to implement this stuff immediately. For example, do not buy any more stock art. Simple. It's one of the simple, do not buy stock art. Those are not real people. They don't represent the type of people that you sell to. They don't look like the people in your office. I've met you. I've been in your offices. They don't look like the people on the website. <laughs> I remember working with one of the strongest dynamics partners in Europe. Uh, has forgotten more about discrete manufacturing than anyone in this room will ever learn. And, uh, and I'm preparing the night before for this two-day workshop, and I go to their website, and they got all these images of people that belong uh, on, uh, on, on, the, on the landing page of a cellular company. Young 25-somethings, la 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 la, sitting around the boardroom. Anyone here ever been on the shop floor of a manufacturing facility? Yeah, right, they, it, and, the, and the, the, usually the gentleman running it, he's slumped over, right, he's got one tie, in his entire portfolio. It's got every lunch he's ever eaten. He's got his ring finger ripped off. Right? Anyone in manufacturing forgets to take off the ring at some point, gets their finger ripped off. They're in a, oh, he's shaking. Oh, you're manufacturing, eh? Yeah, you too, yeah. Right? They're like, oh, they got fur growing out everywhere. Like, that's a manufacturing person. Not some 25-year-old hipster, right? So <laughs> that was how I opened up my meeting with them not something Austrians like, right? So simple things like that. Put pictures up on your website of, of, of images of people. Take, get permission from a customer to go in and take pictures of their facility. Make it real. Put your own people on your website. That's authentic, right? Little things like that. 